it appears as primitive because it forms the prehistory of capital and of the mode of production corresponding to capital. As we saw throughout part seven, the accumulation of capital is cyclical in its nature. Its starting point is the owners of the means of production and money on one side and workers who have nothing to sell but their labor power on the other. However, through accumulation, this starting point also becomes its end point, finishing with the owners of means of production and money on one side and the sellers of labor power on the other, allowing the process to reproduce itself on a constantly expanding scale. Therefore, the early process and conditions that led up to the formation and creation of a fully developed capitalist system and the social relations that form it must have been the separation of the laborers from their own means of production. Marx argues that this must have been a double process. First, that the means of production and means of subsistence must have been transformed into capital or that an ownership over them was formed. The second is that the immediate producers or original laborers must have been turned into waged workers. This process of the separation of the producers from the means of production or the prehistory that led up to the formation of capitalism proper, Marx refers to as primitive or original accumulation. Hence the historical movement which changes the producers into wage workers appears on the one hand as the emancipation from serfdom and from the fetters of the guilds, and this side alone exists for our bourgeois historians. But on the other hand, these new freedmen become sellers of themselves only after they've been robbed of all their own means of production and of all the guarantees of existence afforded by the old feudal arrangements. And the history of this, their expropriation, is written in the annals of mankind in letters of blood and fire. The myth of political economy is that early capitalism formed simply by capitalists working hard and hoarding their money, and that everyone else was simply lazy and spent all their wealth they earned. Notably, this myth is still very much perpetuated even today, with capitalist apologetics of millionaires and billionaires who pulled themselves up by their bootstraps and got rich simply by their own hard work, while ignoring the workers they exploited or their rich family and inheritance. Another secret, which again is still largely ignored and downplayed even today, is the rewriting or ignoring of history. The transition from the feudal mode of production and with it its replacement of guildmasters and feudal lords with capitalists and the displacement of laborers from their means of production and tools didn't happen with the equal exchanges between a buyer and a seller private property and divine rights of the market. Instead, those concepts were specifically created through the destruction of previous modes of production and concepts of property, with the conquest, enslavement, robbery and murder of many, many people. A lot of people forget that some of the first people to be dominated and exploited by England were English people themselves, and throughout the remaining chapters, Marx now takes a long historical look at this original accumulation and the development and origins of different aspects of the formation of the capitalist mode of production. The history of this expropriation in different countries assumes different aspects and runs through its various phases in different orders of succession and at different periods. In England alone, which we take as our example, has it the classic form. 